All right, well, good morning, church. Welcome to Sunday. As promised earlier in the week, uh, we were going to have some video content for you. It is Sunday. It is Palm Sunday. That is a Sunday before Easter. And um, if you're a lot like me, unfortunately, we have this stay-at-home order here in Michigan because of this uh, coronavirus, this pandemic, this thing that, that's kind of plaguing our nation right now. Um, so we're unfortunately unable to, to meet together as a group and to worship and, and to study and to praise God. Um, but this is kind of where technology is a really great thing. Uh, you know, a lot of times technology is kind of frowned upon, especially with our kids, and technology can be kind of a bad thing. But in this instance, technology is actually a great thing. It's allowing us to get together and, and to still be near each other and, and spend time with one another while staying apart. So... Um, good on technology for that. Uh, I'm coming to you right now from my front living room. Let me kind of give you the little tour here. You see out the front window there. We got the piano in the background. Um, my wife thinks that every house in America needs a piano, so we have a piano. Um, sometimes it gets played, but not by me. Um, as a result, I'm in the front living room. I have two cats, a dog, two kids, and my wife in the rest of the house. So if you hear some weird noises, it's the cats, it's the dog, it's the kids, it's my wife disciplining the kids because they're not listening. Um, just kind of bear with me as we go through this. Uh, this being sort of the first big um, video for us, you know, we did a little preview video um, earlier in the week and this is kind of our first big uh, video. So as a result, I'd love some feedback. Um, Understand that the quality might be a little low. Uh, you know, it'll improve. This is our second video, so bear with us there. Um, and I'll try and improve. It's it's weird to me because I can stand up in front of hundreds of people and talk, and I don't even skip a beat. But for some reason, recording it and putting it online has got me a little on, on angst. So uh, bear with me here. But as I said before, this is Palm Sunday, which is the triumphal entry of Jesus. Jesus is marching towards Jerusalem. He knows that he's marching towards his death. Um, and it, as a result, you know, the disciples are are all with him, and, and we'll read this in the story. Um, but a lot of churches tend to kind of skip over Palm Sunday. Um, it gets mentioned that it's Palm Sunday, but it's not necessarily a, a Palm Sunday focused message. It's just another Sunday, and there's nothing wrong with that. You know, that's not a big deal, but in sort of researching for Easter and reading about the accounts leading up to Jesus' crucifixion, um, I noticed that all four gospel accounts, as Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, mention the triumphal entry of Jesus. And anytime I think we see that in Scripture, we need to pay attention, because if it was important enough that all four accounts mention it, then it should be important to us. So we're going to take a look at the triumphal entry of Jesus today. And keep in mind what's kind of going through the disciples' minds right now. Like, at this point, they're convinced that Jesus is the Messiah. They have no doubts about that. You know, they've seen him do miracles. They've learned from him. They just saw him raise uh, Lazarus from the dead. They have no doubts in their mind that he's the Messiah. But their idea of Messiah and what that meant was a little misguided. Um, their expectations of him were a little off. You know, they thought Messiah is going to be the one that comes in and over, overthrows Rome. Um, they thought he was going to reform the church. I mean, he, he often offended the Pharisees. He hung out with, with the, the least and the, the lost and the last. And, and he really looked down sort of on Judaism, the way it was being practiced. So they, they knew that he was going to change the way that they practice Judaism, and they thought that he was going to overthrow Rome and Roman oppression. And keep that in mind. This is kind of the mindset that they have coming into this moment. So like I said, all four gospel accounts mention the triumphal entry. I'm going to look in Luke, and if you want to follow along with me, um, Luke chapter 19 is where we're going to be. And Luke was actually a physician. He he studied things, and he wrote a 
um, an account, an orderly account of the things that had happened. He studied it. He, he went and interviewed people. He came to conclusions based on the evidence that he had, and then he wrote about it. So I want to take a look at Luke. And like I said, Luke 19, we're going to start in verse 28. So I'm just going to start reading uh, verse 28, and he says, uh, And when he had said these things, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. And when he drew near to Bethphage and Bethany, and the mount called Olivet, he sent two of the disciples, saying, Go into the village in front of you. Uh, Where you are entering, you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it here. And if anyone asks you, Why are you untying it? You shall say this, The Lord... Has need of it. So those who were sent went away and found it just as he has told them. And just to sort of set this up for you, right? Bethany overlooked Jerusalem and it overlooked the temple. And so Jesus sends out his disciples to get this colt, to get the donkey, and to bring it back to him. And I'm wondering, like, what's going on with the others? Like, what exactly is happening right now? Is this like, I kind of picture it as like a superhero moment, right? And we've all seen like the superhero movies, like the the Avenger movies or, you know, Batman's not a superhero. I'm sorry. I was going to say Batman, but Batman is not a superhero. Um, I don't know where you stand on that, but that's that's a tangent. So like the superhero movies are right? um, like that moment where the city is in chaos and the villain is having his way with the city and the superhero takes a moment to just overlook the city and see what's going on before he swoops in to save the day. And and I can just see Jesus sitting there in Bethany, overlooking the temple, overlooking Jerusalem and his disciples there with him, like thinking this is the moment, like it's about to happen. This is going to go down. So back to scripture, Uh, verse 33 says, uh, and as they were untying the colt, Its owner said to them, Why are you untying the colt? And they said to him, The Lord has need of it. And they brought it to Jesus, throwing their cloaks on the colt, and they sat Jesus on it. See, we actually learn from Matthew and John's account of this, uh, that this happened to fulfill Old Testament prophecy. And if you're ever, like, on the fence, if you're a person that's really not sure what you believe and you're not sure that you won't, you won't, maybe you want to believe the Bible, maybe you don't. If you're really unsure where you are there, I think this is one reason why you need to consider it as true. I mean, there's a lot of evidence as to why the Bible is true. But one of the things that, that always stands out to me as I read these gospel accounts of Jesus is, you know, the writers didn't hold anything back, even about themselves. Even, even when they were wrong, things that were embarrassing, like they never hold anything back. John actually says um, in John 12, 16, that his disciples did not understand these things. But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been done to him. Like they admit their own ignorance. Um, they were good Jewish boys. They grew up knowing the scripture. They knew the prophecies. And John admits like, hey, we didn't realize it at the time. We were with Jesus. We we threw our, our, our cloaks, our, our coats on the donkey and and Jesus sat on it and rode into Jerusalem, but we, we had no idea that that was the moment that the prophecy referred to. You see, and, and actually it, it kind of reinforces the fact that, that they had misconceptions about what Jesus was here to do. They, they missed the prophecy of the Messiah, and, and he wasn't going to abolish Judaism and the law. He was actually going to fulfill it. You know, he wasn't going to overthrow Rome. He, he would actually eventually die by their hand. I mean, the kingdom that he spoke of wasn't one of, of literal rule. It was a kingdom of spiritual and eternal rule. See, the disciples had their own ideas of Jesus, but they were gravely mistaken as to what Jesus was, what he was there to do. And they later admitted that fact. Uh, back to scripture, verse 36 says this, um, and as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road and, and palm trees. They pulled palm leaves out of the trees and laid them on the ground. And that's hence Palm Sunday, um, as a sign of respect and honor 
to Jesus as he rode into Jerusalem. Verse 37 says, And as he was drawing near, already on the way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. I can just see him thinking, like, this is our moment. This is the moment we've been waiting for. Jesus is about to ride in and take control. Buckle up your seatbelts. Here we go. And there was a large crowd. You know, it wasn't just the 12. Jesus had many disciples. There's probably hundreds of people at this point following Jesus. They had just seen him raise Lazarus from the dead. They had just witnessed the unthinkable. Jesus brought someone back to life, someone that was physically and spiritually dead. Remember, Lazarus was dead for three days, which means, according to their tradition, he was not just physically, but spiritually dead. His spirit had departed the body. And they watched Lazarus walk out because Jesus called him out of the grave. They saw something amazing. And they're following him and they're praising him in this moment. They believed he was the Messiah until he no longer fit their expectations. In fact, some of the same people that were there praising his name as he rode into Jerusalem were later cursing his name when he hung on a cross. But in this moment, they're, they're praising him. Here comes Jesus. Here comes our Savior. Verse 39 says, And some of the Pharisees said in, in the crowd, which Wherever Jesus went, there were always Pharisees. They were always trying to accuse him. So it's no surprise that Jesus is marching into Jerusalem and the Pharisees are there. And the crowd's cheering on Jesus and they say, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. Remember, this isn't just the twelve. This is hundreds of people shouting Jesus' name, praising Jesus. The Pharisees stopped. It says, you got to stop. You got to tell them to stop. This is blasphemy. And Jesus answered the Pharisees in verse 40. And he said, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. So take this in. The disciples, right? They're looking for a political leader. They're looking for someone to take charge and overthrow this overly religious Jewish leadership and the Roman oppression, they had false expectations of Jesus. And I wonder, have you, have you ever had false expectations? I mean, I know, I know I have. I think we all have. We can all think about something that we thought would happen but didn't. Something that we, we thought would, would go in our favor and it didn't. Somebody that we thought we could trust them to do this thing, but they didn't. They didn't do it. You know, we, we've all thought that. I mean, look at what we're going through right now. I think a lot of people thought, and, and I saw it on social media, like a lot of people thought, I'm really glad 2019 is over. Here comes 2020. It's going to be our year. I mean, we all thought that. And we all have hope for a new year. We all have great expectations going into this new year. And I'm not saying that that, couldn't still happen this year. And I'm not saying that it hasn't happened for you this year, but I think we'd all agree that 2020 hasn't exactly been the type of year that we expected it would be. I wonder, what are you expecting right now that may or may not work in your favor? What kind of expectations do you have for yourself and for the, for the people in your life? The disciples had false expectations that they didn't realize at the time were false or misplaced. And actually what Jesus does next further exasperates those, those expectations, those misconceptions that they had. You see, Jesus takes a moment to sort of weep over Jerusalem, and he turns and he heads for the temple. And I'm going to read Mark, Mark's account of this. Mark 11:15 says this, And they came to Jerusalem, and he, he being Jesus, he entered the temple and began to drive out those who sold and those who bought in the temple. And he overturned the table of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. And he would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. 
And he was teaching them, saying to them, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations. But you have made it a den of robbers. So what's going on here is, is the, the Jews are making this annual uh, trip to the temple. They have a temple tax that they have to pay annually. So they're going to pay this tax. And while we're there, we're going to make a sacrifice to God. And we're going to ask God to atone us for our sins with this sacrifice. See, but the Jewish leaders saw an opportunity to, um, to take advantage of and extort the people that were coming to offer their best to God. And that's what was happening. See, these people are coming to offer, but they convinced them that their best wasn't good enough. It was, you know, it's like, um, you know, yes, sir, I, I see that you've come to the temple to make a sacrifice, but... Um, are you certain that God will accept that as a sacrifice? I mean, I see there's a couple small spots on it there. Um, I, do you really want to offer that to God? I, well, no, I guess, I guess not. But this is the best, the best that I have. Well, you know, well, fortunately, we have spotless lambs over there, and, and they're perfect. They're ready to be sacrificed um, for a small fee, of course. Well, I don't, I don't have enough money to. To buy a lamb. Well, then I guess a pigeon will do. Um, do, do you want to buy a pigeon for the sacrifice? And well, well sure. Well, I guess that that'll be good enough. Here's some money. And well, oh, oh my, sir. I, I'm sorry. I guess you didn't realize this, but we can't accept that money here. That that money has the likeness of Caesar on it. And Caesar thinks he's a God, and, and we cannot have that in our temple. There is only one God, so we don't accept that. We only accept temple currency here. Huh. I, I, don't, I don't have any temple currency. Hmm. Well, then you can walk right over this way. There's the money changer table, and they'll be happy to help you. They will take your, your money, and they will change it to temple currency. And, and after that... Um, you know, there's a, there's a small fee, of course, to, to change your money over. You know, but after that, um, you'll be good to go. I mean, you want to give your best to God, right? Well, I guess. They had, and maybe that was kind of silly and stupid and I shouldn't have done it, but, but that's kind of the mindset that they had. That's what was happening here. You know, they had taken a tradition and they had perverted it in such a way that they were taking advantage. And that's what Jesus is talking about. In verse 18, the chief priests and the scribes heard what Jesus did. They heard he went in and wrecked the temple, and he's teaching these things. And they were seeking to destroy him, for they feared him, because all the crowd was astonished at his teaching. And when evening came, they went out and into the city. People were astonished. People had no idea that this is what Judaism could have been. They, they had no clue. And the Pharisees and the chief priests and the scribes were scared because Jesus was removing our power. He took other people's interests above tradition. Now, throughout this entire account, leading up to and including Jesus' death, the disciples had misplaced expectations. I mean, Jesus is going to come in and change everything. Their faith was in Jesus's ability to take control. I mean, he commanded the crowd. He drew thousands of followers. I mean, surely he would soon take control of the temple and then march on to Rome. Like their belief was that Jesus would rule over Jerusalem and lead them against Rome. I mean, they even argued with each other who was going to sit at his right hand and at his left hand after he took his throne, the, the physical throne that they thought he was going to take. Their confidence was so misplaced that when he was crucified, they abandoned him and disappeared. Like they thought they were wrong. Like Jesus wasn't who we thought he was. And now the, the religious leaders have killed him. Rome doesn't care. Like, they're going to come after us next. We got to go. When he was placed in a tomb, they disappeared and returned 
to their previous jobs. This wasn't a moment where Jesus sprung off the cross and said, gotcha, and we're good. It's like he's dead. He's in a tomb. He's gone. Maybe, maybe I can go back to doing what I did before and return to some sort of normalcy. So let me ask you again, what or where are you placing your faith right now? Like what kind of expectations do you have that may be unrealistic? You know, I think as people, we have a tendency of putting our faith in certain things and they're, they're normal. Like it's normal to put our faith in these things, things like, like money, right? And that's normal. We need money to survive. Money is very important and necessary in our culture today. We have to have it. You have to buy food. You need gas in the car for groceries. You need a place to live. And these, I mean, these things cost money. And money concerns are legitimate. Managing our money is something that we all need to do. I mean, admit it. Like when you're at a place where you have a lot of money, you have little bills and nothing on the credit card, and you've got some money and savings, you feel relaxed. You feel a little more at ease. But when you have a little money, and things are tight, and bills are due, and I was just laid off, and the governor says, I can't go to work, I don't have money, and I start to get panicky and nervous, and I start to lose Money brings a lot of people anxiety, and that's, that's normal. I mean, especially when you're facing something like we're facing now. Like, you want to go to work. You want to make money. You want to provide for your family, but you're told you can't. And money starts getting tight, and I start getting anxious, and I start to lose faith. And Jesus, uh, Jesus talked a lot about money, so... So it was very clear that that this was something that was going to plague us. And while we need to properly manage our money, it shouldn't be the sole place of faith and comfort for us. I mean, everybody knows a verse in 1 Timothy that the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And that's the love of money, just to be clear. We're not saying that money is the root of all evil, but the love of money is is the root of all evil. And Jesus even said in Matthew 6 that that a person cannot serve two masters. You cannot serve God and money. And when he finished with that teaching, he led right into a teaching about anxiety. I think Jesus knew that money and money worries was going to be something that plagues us. We need to keep in mind, money is important, but we need to make sure that we're not people who solely rely on money as our source of peace. What about people? We place a lot of faith in people, right? I mean, especially ones who have proven worthy in the past. We put our our faith in people like our family, our boss, maybe co-workers. We put our faith in our our local and our state leaders and our government. And that's okay. I mean... We need to rely on people. We should be people who our yes is yes and our no is no. We should be trustworthy people, and we should trust people to do the same. You know, we we can't do life alone. You cannot do life alone. We were made for community. We were made to be together. That's part of what's making what's going on right now so difficult. We were made for community, and as a result, we have to at times put our faith in others. And we've all been there. Like once you've been burned by somebody, we've we've all been there. When someone fails to live up to your expectations of them at any level, your faith in that person disappears. And it, it gets really hard to give that faith back. Listen, we need to be people who rely on and support each other. But, big but, We have to be sure that we are not placing false or unreal expectations on the people that we depend on. We need to make sure that our expectations 
are good expectations. And I, you know, I think we place a lot of faith in our stuff too. You know, the things that we have, the things that we own, we put a, we put a lot of faith in those things in our house, our car, our appliances, in technology. You know, and, and we become to utilize these things to make our lives easier and more convenient. And there's nothing wrong with that. And, and in a lot of ways, these things have become great tools of the faith. I mean, look at what we're doing right now. We cannot physically meet because of what's going on, yet we can still connect. We can still worship. We can still be with one another because of technology, because of the things. You know, it, it helps the church stay in community to lift each other up and to support each other in hard times. The problem is when these things begin to break down or they begin to fail, like, and it leads to a lot of stress and anxiety. It's human. It's understandable that it's going to lead to stress and anxiety, especially when the things that we have is so closely tied to money. You know, another thing that leads to stress and anxiety, and now something breaks and I have to pay to fix it, but I don't have the money and it just stress on top of stress on top of stress and it weighs you down. We need to be people who own our stuff and don't let our stuff own you. I mean, have concern for what you have. Be good stewards of it. Take care of it. Manage it well. But don't let your stuff's failure lead to unnecessary stress and anxiety. And again, you know, Given the current situation in our country and in the world, you know, we're facing right now a lot of anxiety, a lot of stress. It's hard to avoid. And we shouldn't be ashamed of it. We shouldn't be worried about it. Like, don't feel bad. It's it's human. You know, when, th- when we're taking out of our normal rhythm, what we are used to, what we are comfortable with, we get stress, we get anxiety, we get fear. Those things are normal, and it's normal to experience that, and it's normal to feel that. We need to make sure, though, that we don't let it control us. See, Paul, the Apostle Paul, wrote a letter to the church in Philippi. And in Philippians 4, most of us have heard this before, but listen to the words real quick. Philippians 4, verse 4, Paul writes this. He says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Listen, the one of the only things that is as contagious as fear and anxiety is hope. Listen, we need to do what Paul says right now. Let our reasonableness be known to everyone. Spread hope, not fear. Spread optimism, not anxiety. He keeps going and he says, do not be anxious for anything. And you know, sometimes this is so much easier to read. It's so much easier to say than it is to do. He says, do not be anxious for anything, but when you're feeling anxious, when you don't know what to do, when you're unsure, he says, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Listen, let God know what's bothering you. Let God know the source of your anxiety, the source of your stress, the source of your discomfort. Talk to God about it. And here's the thing with prayer. God already knows, right? God knows what's bothering you. God knows the source of your anxiety. He knows that you're on edge. Praying, though, will bring you into the presence of God. Praying isn't an informative thing where we can say, Hey, God, just so you know, um, I don't know if you've been paying attention, but just so you know, this is what's going on in my life right now. Like God knows that, but by praying, we take a moment to, to exhale. We take a moment to bring our mind at ease. 
bring ourselves into the presence of God. Praying is not going to do anything to inform God. It's going to help change us. Paul keeps going in verse 7 and he says, When you do this, when you pray, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. He says, And the peace of God, which surpasses all, all understanding, and, and we've seen this before, right? We we know what this means, the peace of God that surpasses all understanding. It's like when you see someone and they're going through something really difficult, and it's like, I don't, I don't understand how they're holding it together. How can you be so strong given what you're going through? It's the peace of God. Paul says the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And to help accomplish this, okay, so you prayed. You brought yourself into the presence of God. I still feel anxious. What do I do? Paul says this in verse 8. He says, finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, Whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, whatever is excellence, if there is anything, anything worthy of praise, think about these things. And I don't like the word think here. Um, A better translation would be to dwell on these things. The Greek word there means to account for. It's not a one-time reminder. That's not going to do. It's a continuous reflection. Okay, don't, what he's saying, don't focus on the stress and anxiety. He says, if it's, if it's true, if it's honorable, if it's just, if it's pure, if it's lovely, commendable, excellent, if it is anything at all worthy of praise, continually reflect on these things. Don't focus on the pain and the stress in the world. It's only going to breed more pain and stress in your own life. Instead, he's saying, focus on the good and the goodness of God. And Paul finishes his letter this way. He says in verse 11, Now I am not speaking of being in need, you see, because the the church was concerned about him. and They wanted to send him things. They thought, Paul needs needs money. He needs food. We need to take care of Paul. And Paul's saying here, I'm not speaking of being in need. He says, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low and I know how to abound. You know, some of us know that. We understand that. We've been brought low and man, are we low right now. Some of us know how to abound and we're doing okay right now. Paul says, in any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. And that famous verse we've all heard says, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. I can do all things by the power of God through faith in Jesus. Church, during an uncertain time, bringing a lot of people fear, anxiety, worry. We, church, we need to be the hope and the calm and the peace that the world looks at and says, you know what, I want some of that. I want some of what he has. I want peace like that. I want calm like she has. I want peace like he has. Don't be overwhelmed with fear and anxiety right now. Rather, we need to focus on the good and the goodness of God. Don't let our expectations that that 2020 was going to be something great and it has turned into this nightmare. Like, Don't let those false expectations we have drive us into a hole like it did the disciples. Be the good 
and the goodness. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone around you. Be Jesus to the people around you. Isaiah 41.10 says this, Fear not, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Let's be that light right now to our community. Let's be reasonable. Let's be peace. Let's be love. And in doing so, we can be the hands and the feet of Jesus for those around us. Listen, guys, I just want to pray for you real quick, and then we'll be on our way. God, I just thank you so much. I thank you for this technology, for the ability for us to to utilize it for your purpose, to bring the Word of God into our communities, to, to study, to praise, to love and lift up one another, even in times where we have to be separated. God, I pray that you would be with us right now. Put our hearts at ease, God. We know, we know that that you are our source of source of, of strength and wisdom, God. We know that that you hold the world in your hands, that you control everything, God, and that this thing that is happening to us right now is not something that surprised you. It's not something that caught you off guard, but you, God, are very much in control. We know that we can trust you, that all things work to the good for those who love you, who have been called according to you, God. And and I pray that you would be with us today. Be with us today. Be with us this week. Be with us as we prepare to celebrate the death, burial, resurrection of your son, Jesus, on Easter, God. Be with us always. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Guys, thank you. Thank you for tuning in. Um, Again, I wish you the best. I pray blessings for you. I I pray that you guys would be safe. Thanks for checking us out. And I look forward to bringing you some more stuff next week on Easter.